now let's uh, skip the break in the interest of time and uh, go to the next uh, item on the agenda. It is my distinct honor to introduce to you Dr. Robert Hampshire, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at uh, the US Department of Transportation. Uh, Dr. Hampshire was previously an Associate Professor at the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan, where he was also a Research Associate Professor at uh, the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute, AMTRI, and the Michigan Institute for Data Science. He also had an appointment as an affiliated faculty member, the Department of Industrial and Operations Engineering at uh, Michigan. Uh, previously, Dr. Hampshire uh, has been an assistant professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University and was a visiting professor at uh, MIT. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Hampshire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully this works. second to share my screen. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Raj, uh, for, for having me. Uh, I wanna thank the, all the UTCs who are uh, participating and all the participants today. Um, this is a great honor for me actually, uh, in the sense of many of the folks who I really look up to and have uh, made my career uh, with their su great support from the very beginnings of my career to, uh, to the current uh, point are here. And I really uh, am appreciative of that, you know, from you, Raj, but also Stan Caldwell, I see his name there, uh, to John Piha and Chris Hendrickson. I won't say all the names, but folks at Carnegie Mellon know that uh, it was a very special place and, and time for me there. Uh, and also at University of Michigan, I see several folks from Dave Eby to others. So I've had the great pleasure to, to participate in research and be part of multiple UTCs. First uh, through Traffic 21 and Mobility 21 at uh, Carnegie Mellon, but also at the University of Michigan, initially the Atlas Center and also CCAT. So uh, it's, again, thank you for uh, having me. And I, uh, I appreciate you. Uh, giving up your break. And so I'll try to keep my remarks somewhat clear, short and, and, and cogent. Uh, so as Raj mentioned, I'm the Acting Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology for Department of Transportation starting January 20th. And we're not quite a hundred days in, but we've been moving very quickly to implement, accelerate, the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration. And some of those key priorities are one, getting past COVID, beating COVID. Um, last month, we passed the American Rescue Plan. That's funding to get us past COVID to support state and locals, but also support transit and other transportation modes. Another priority is building back better. You guys have heard that. That's the currently where we are, the infrastructure plan. Um, and part of the better is certainly technology, uh, innovating mobility for all. But also part of better is it has to be equitable. And this is, here we're talking specifically racial equity and justice. Uh, we saw that the first day of this administration, President Biden signed an executive order to accelerate racial equity across the federal government and all of our programs. This is something that's very uh, front burner, something that a decision criteria that we're evaluating all <laughs> proposals and opportunities. Um, and that's part of the building back better is to make sure it's equitable. Uh, what we've seen in Minnesota, for example, the uh, tragedy, all too many of these things actually are, occur adjacent to or related to vehicles or transportation. Uh, I think a transportation community has to take some responsibility for that or innovate in ways that 
uh, con contributed to, to mitigating adverse interactions or other sorts of things that happen around vehicles. So I will just name that explicitly as a place of, of innovation and, and um, work that needs to be done. And certainly last but not least is living up to our climate responsibilities. Over the last four years, there was countless amounts, gigatons of carbon that were emitted into, this, um, into the atmosphere that we can't get back easily. And so we're working very diligently. The president on the first day, again, of this administration signed climate crisis executive orders and promptly re-entered the United States into the Paris Agreement. So these are key priorities by which we're evaluating uh, the, it's a, the Department of Transportation is supporting and driving change. And Secretary Pete, uh, that's what we call him, uh, is certainly a leader on all of these uh, fronts. So as you may know as well, the Building Back Better has turned into the American Jobs Plan. That's the current infrastructure bill uh, plan that's being discussed. In, in, in that plan, I'll just say a few things just to kind of level set us where we are. You know, a large part of this American Jobs Plan is focused on fixed highways, you know, rebuilding bridges, upgrading ports, airports, transit systems, things we think of as, you know, traditional transportation uh, infrastructure. By the way, this bill, this plan is in addition to reauthorization. So for those, so reauthorization is going to happen in a different track. So this is, the American Jobs Plan is in addition to reauthorization is the way it's being formulated. You know, these investments as well are going to be driven by, you know, with the goal of advancing racial equity by providing better jobs, better transportation options uh, to underserved communities. You've also seen actions that this administration's halted a highway project in Houston that was seen as adversely affecting underserved, overburdened communities nearby. And so we are, uh, this administration is, is very serious about community participation, engagement and transportation planning process. So you'll continue possibly to see more <laughs> projects that, you know, need to have equity built into it at the beginning. Uh, also part of the American Jobs Plan I want to highlight again is that, you know, these investments, you know, certainly, uh, you know, are aimed at climate and climate innovation. There's lots of funding there for, uh, for research. We've seen large dollars for a research enterprise across the federal government from the NSF to DOE to DLT. And so we've been at the table advocating for research at DLT and that includes all of our UTC family as part of that American Jobs Plan. And this is what I just said, okay. Um, so part of you know, these priorities is certainly uh, innovation. Uh, and so let me just say a few things about that here. So certainly we know that, <laughs> I'm speaking, Carnegie Mellon's hosting this, right? So we know innovation is definitely on the menu. Uh, as, and it continues to be a key priority that we're going to support and continue to, to help accelerate. Um, yeah, I want to kind of focus us on a couple of things as we look, think about COVID and post-COVID type of innovation, something called telemobility. And this is sort of the hybrid between the future of work and the future of travel. They're called telemobility, you know, particularly, as I said, in the aftermath of, of 2020 and COVID, we need to look at, you know, how travel of all types will continue and be impacted or how it will evolve. You, we know, and there was a, a small group earlier, you know, reported out that, you know, we've seen during COVID that travel, um, particularly personal travels has dropped dramatically, but at the same time, we see delivery and freight increase, right? And so we got to we're standing up a, a survey, uh, hopefully to 
understand that new normal. So there's a lot of opportunity to really figure out what that new normal looks like uh, post COVID. You know, you also think about telemobility in terms of people who already have had limited access to mobility beforehand. So we were all quarantined. So imagine those, many people have, were, have been quarantined their whole lives or a large portion, portion of their lives recently. Think about elderly, think about those with disabilities. And so I think we all may have a, a new sense of empathy of what it means to lack access and lack mobility and what that does to not just your, your traveling, but your psychology, your social networks, and your sense of efficacy and self. So I think this is a great point of, of empathy that as um, someone from the small group reported out that we can learn from and, and hopefully uh, accelerate that empathy. Uh, and certainly I thought there were panels earlier, of course, about pushing forward with automated driving ADAS systems and, uh, and UASs, you know, unmanned systems. And so these are all things that I want to encourage you all to continue to, to push and innovate on like you have been. Um, and, and that's we're continue to support that, but we're supporting innovation through the lens of the priorities that I set we set out before. Right. And that's building back better, equity, climate, and making sure that we're doing this in a sustainable way. Um, you know, and so this is part about, you know, technology. You know, we want to do it in a way that that serves our serves values. You know, particularly around community-based or called organic organic innovation. And here, you know, we're talking about work, and many people here on the call already do this, working hand in hand with communities to understand their needs. Right, they have community-driven innovation. You know, particularly. Uh, I have to harken back to days in Pittsburgh. There's classic examples of community-based uh, tr transportation services. You don't have to look any further than, of course, August Wilson here in, in, in Pittsburgh. The great, play, the great playwright from Pittsburgh uh, who, you know, who wrote famously Fences, My Rainey's Black Bottom, wrote a series of plays, of course, based in the Hill District in Pittsburgh. And one of those plays, as we know, is called a Jitney, which centers on, uh, <clears throat> you know, about unlicensed cap taxi cab drivers in Pittsburgh. Sort of think Uber before Uber. And we know that uh, in this play, one of the main characters says, you know, we're providing a service to the community. These are the Jitney drivers. We ain't just rides to people we're providing them a service. That's why you answer the, the phone car service. Part of the service is providing people with a way to get their groceries home, to get their suitcases down to the bus station or to the airport so they can go home to visit their mama or whoever it is they want to visit. I want everyone to pull their weight and provide the service that's expected of us. You know, that quote from a famous play, a Tony award-winning play, really speaks to this sort of seeing transportation as a, a service to others. And that's a legacy of, of Pittsburgh and community-based transportation services that I wanted us to think about as a, when we think of this empathetic mindset as a service to others, as a way, to, as a source, a, a creative source for innovation. So that was, of course, August Wilson. Again, so, you know, our solutions should be meaningful and include, you know, community at large, you know, private companies, state trans transit agencies, all of us, you know, uh, should think about and continue a qualitative approach as well as our quantitative modeling and technology development. So let me pivot a bit here to climate. And so as well, another source of inspiration for innovation these days are the climate crisis. You know, we're dealing with, you know, just in the last couple of years from the bomb cyclones <laughs> in Oklahoma to the wildfires to, um, 
you know, the power grid down in Texas, you know, we're dealing with these natural disasters, but not just one, it's kind of compounding stressors. These are disasters on top of disasters, right? COVID and a wildfire you know, and electric grid failure at the same time. And so I, I do want us to, you know, and what we're looking at at DLT, we think about our climate and resiliency work is the interaction between multiple disasters and multiple systems, right? And we're getting, things are getting so extreme with uh, particularly natural disasters that we have to plan for multiple of them happening at the same time. I think that's how far, you know, we are, that's where we are. And so I, I wanna encourage us to think about, when we think about climate, that intersection of multiple things happening at once. And that kind of encourages us to have a more systems-based approach. We know we have the social, you know, technical type of systems, but then with the natural component as well. And so many of you on the call here have been leaders in that, and that's something that we've been pushing within DOT because we know that as a system, climate is there, but climate is so interrelated with our other priorities, such as equity as well. And so let's pivot a little bit to, to equity and say a few things about this priority. You know, things are improving, but we know that the, the historically the standard transportation planning processes often have left many people out. Uh, and in fact, that is inadvertently or even more actively exclusion. And, and so, you know, this is, I think, there's a lot of empirical evidence in, in, in about this, you know, we don't wanna be backward looking. The idea here is moving forward in a way in which we can have prosperity and opportunity available to the broadest set of, of people. And, you know, particularly We've seen this, you know, as we look again in the COVID times, when we think about equity here, the, the racial component, but there's also, you know, particularly, we're not exclusively thinking about that. It's also low income communities, we call underserved communities, overburdened communities, ones particularly around pollution, communities which have, you know, borne the burden of pollution in particulate matters. Uh, but I heard the conversation earlier in the report outs. We're also talk, thinking about rural communities. You know, that that first and last mile is like more like first and last, you know, 20 miles. And that and that's a real, that's a real part of the, the story and particularly this administration's uh, priorities as well. It's not just an urban story. Uh, it's inclusive to include our, our family and, and friends in, in uh, rural communities. One point I want to drive home, particularly on, on equity, is that, and tying that together with climate, as we're thinking about it, it, part of this conference, I see we have freight, you know, a, a focus on moving goods as well. And I want us to reflect on the fact that resiliency, there's a hypothesis out there that more equitable communities are also more resilient communities. So there's a set of empirical results in, in literature that shows that places that, particularly as it comes to transportation, were more equitable and more accessible uh, before a natural disaster actually fare better and are able to recover and bounce back. And so in these ways, if we just as a thought experiment, think about our more, are, is resi what's the relationship between resiliency and equity? And, I, and there's a body of literature now that's, that's making that connection uh, uh, in, in validating that hypothesis. So I, I drive, I, um, I wanna encourage us to think about that as well. And as, as I mentioned, as we're, we're thinking about freight and movements of goods, I think, Again, that you know the the ability for our systems to really withstand, thrive, bounce back from various multiple disasters. We've seen uh, that <laughs> right before our eyes in 2020. 
as it relates to COVID, you know, how uh, freight, you know, it's in some ways it's fared. The system has had its ups and downs from the Suez Canal most recently, you know, we could see that was, you know, pop, uh, caused by a sandstorm, wind, winds from a sandstorm that could be climate related as well. And, but you also see the port out in Long Beach, you know, the backup of, of freight. And so again, one of the things I've really come to appreciate more at the Department of Transportation is multimodal uh, perspectives, particularly on freight and freight resilience. Here, I'm thinking about ports, for example, and port communities. You have, you know, maritime, we have, the fr we have freight there, and we have communities nearby that are oftentimes overburdened by pollution. So, and rail. So there's that particular multimodal hub uh, is something that is a place of, of study because it's a bottleneck, um, particularly under multiple um, compounding stressors like disasters. And so I encourage uh, all of us in UTCs who are already thinking about this to continue uh, in that work. I'll just fast forward just a little bit just for time. Um, and I wanna just point out a few things that are on the horizons now that as resources at the um, Department of Transportation and Office of Research that are available and we're standing up um, as it relates to research. And so one of them that I wanna highlight it's called the Highly Automated System Safety Center of Excellence. It's a newly authorized uh, center within the Department of Transportation called Haas. And we're built, standing up a, a capability or capacity within the office to assess automation, technical expertise, but across modes. So we're thinking automated systems within rail. We know that that is, is certainly uh, around airlines, freight, passenger travel. And so taking a multimodal approach to automation and what can be learned and leveraged across uh, the modes. And so the Haas COE, uh, you, got, you all might've seen announcements about it, but there'll be programming other supports in which a system support services for UTCs and others to kind of think about automation across the modes. I think that's a, a role that the federal government can play to try to take a, a broader multimodal view. And that's something that we're, we're standing up and, and want uh, to provide as a, a service and, and the resources to those on this call. So you'll, you'll hear more about that uh, soon. And one of the activities of the Haas COE is a program we're calling Voices. It's an open source platform. Uh, we call it Virtual Open Innovation, as you see here, collaborative, collaborative Environment for Safety. And what this is really solving for, and there's, you know, possibly other such platforms out there, but really in turn to incentivize and a, as a platform for collaborative research, particularly around connected and automated systems. And so here, individuals can, in a shared platform, test various automated systems, be it vehicles, UASs, uh, be it uh, different uh, types of connected infrastructure. Think about, you know, roadside units with various, uh, diff you know, different types of algorithms on them. But in a an environment where each individual can test their own software, but get access to, ex be exposed to other systems. So imagine Ford motor vehicle, you know, a Ford autonomous vehicle and a Waymo autonomous vehicle being simulated in the same environment. And what happens when they interact with each other? You know, how, what are those behaviors? And so it's a whole set of activities that are being stood up and it's called Voices. And I think many people on this call might have already, you know, participated in the first community of practice uh, meeting. 
But this is a, a capability that's actually being ported from the Department of Defense world of, a, of an environment that we believe that the role of our office and the federal government could take this perspective of a platform that can enable this type of interoperability. So that's something that we're going to make available to UTCs, to students. It's an open platform. Uh, and so please keep your eyes open uh, for that activity. And let me, I'll wrap up here uh, as we get closer to time. I'll just stop sharing. You know, what I want to, you know, to, at the end of all this, really, you know, I really want to go back to this idea of mobility for all. You know, um, you know this is the idea that we're trying to facilitate at the Office of Research and Technology. Uh, we saw the priorities, particularly for this administration, has this idea of you know mobility for all, be it you know people and freight, but in the framework, particularly around equity and living up to our climate responsibilities. Those things are interrelated and in ways in which we could, in frameworks for creativity, for innovation, where we could actually move closer to actually having uh, mobility for all. And so with that, let me, I'll stop. And I'm not sure, Roger, if there's time for any Q&A, but again, I just wanna say that I'm honored to, to be here and thank you for uh, continuing all the great work <laughs> at the UTCs and look to, to my office and Department of Transportation as a, as a resource. I do want to re-engage this, re, you know, the relationship between DLT and external stakeholders, particularly, but also UTCs to make it jointly beneficial. So uh, with that, I will end and say thank you. Uh, that thank you, Dr. Hampshire. Uh, on behalf of the, of the audience, if I may ask one question, could you say something about uh, the UTC program and how the administration used the program, what could we do to improve? Yeah, thank you, Raj. Um, I think this question comes up often, uh, particularly as we're doing the reauthorization proposal, you know, uh, language. Uh, I think everyone is really always blown away by the, the breadth of work happening at UTCs. Um, and I think that there is a, a desire to learn more about what you all are working on. There's so much work happening. And so there is a desire to, yeah, I'll just say to learn more and to be it, you know, white papers that you all uh, create, briefings, all that is very much appreciated and, and, and more of it is actually uh, desired. So that'd be one thing I would say. Um, and I think working with uh, Caesar and the UTC team uh, for the next reauthorizations, we're, we're certainly proposing funding so that we can unlock a lot of the, the, the knowledge uh, and, and be able to pr promote it uh, better. And so those are some of the key um, factors. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amshaira. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Hampshire, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your vision and priorities for the Office of Research and uh, Technology and thank for uh, motivating us to uh, soar to uh, greater heights to accomplish the goals of uh, equity and climate change. So we appreciate you participating here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let me take this opportunity also to thank uh, Cesar Singh uh, for his uh, persistent and ongoing leadership of the UTG program and uh, the UTC team, of course, so that all of us at the UTCs appreciate uh, for their guidance and uh, support. Uh, Denise Dunn, Robin Klein, Amy Stearns, and uh, Don Tucker-Thomas, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, let me also thank uh, all the UTCs, uh, the directors for both the uh, mobility-themed UTCs uh, in particular, and uh, all the UTCs in uh, general. Thanks for uh, participating today like to uh, extend my gratitude to all the other participants from uh, the private sector, the public sector, uh, and the nonprofit sector. Uh, uh, we have been going through turbulent times, which will continue for some time. Uh, we should take a seat at the table and uh, argue for uh, uh, constructive uh, outcomes, uh, promote advocacy, as uh, Ken pointed out, uh, 
I was pointed out earlier in the panel as well. Uh, you need people to lead the change at the individual level, uh, as UTCs, as communities and such. Let's make a uh, change for the better, uh, build back better. Uh, so, so thank you all again. Uh, 